Anyways, one of the suggestions was really to get some, some feedback. I'm going to roll through some uh, from everybody in this room as well. So if you could, if you got some comment, please. I think uh, some of your folks, some of your subcommittees would like to hear some of the suggestions or recommendations or ideas that you have. None are wrong, none are bad. We just want to get everybody involved in everything that's going on here in Circuit 12. Is that correct? Okay. So I'm going to talk briefly. I'm going to get to some of the data that I want to share with everybody here in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but first, I want to talk just a little bit about civil citations. I understand you all have the civil citation programs here. I know there's some differences between the counties and how many you're eligible to have. So again, it talks about, you know, you have to train your officers on trauma awareness. Again, we talk about mental health, trauma awareness, adverse childhood experiences. Those are all very relevant in terms of, you know, cutting a child a break and not arresting them. There's consequences to the arrest. So civil citations are a great, great, great tool that I hope your community is really embracing. Okay, and if you can, if you look at some of your programs and civil citations, those will be maybe what you want to spend some of your money on to make those programs better. Okay, because civil citations are diversions where? It's going to be a test after this class is done. <laughs> civil citations are a diversion where? Does the state attorney issue civil citations? No. The gatekeepers issue civil citations. The cops. Okay, we issue those civil citations. We do them in the streets. Miami-Dade takes all their kids, I think, to the Jack Center. And that's where they're issued civil citations. So I'm a big advocate. You issue them on the streets. You issue them at the stores. Our policy is that you have to attempt to contact the parents, but don't let the parents be the reason why you arrest somebody okay, or not contacting a parent. Uh, we do call the Jack Center to decide if somebody's eligible for a civil citation, so thank you guys for doing that. So you have to train your officers on a benefit because four years ago we didn't really use our civil citations. We had a program, but we didn't really use it, and that's one of the tools that you're going to be able to utilize. It's got to be backed up by policy that's going to reduce some of your arrest data and your DMC numbers. So that's just number one. So you got to strengthen your policy. So again, we did the educational piece of it. Now it is required if a child is eligible for a civil citation because in Alachua County, you're eligible for two. Why not three? Because I lost that argument, okay? So you're eligible for two, okay? Now I do have a policy at the Gainesville Police Department that you, can, you don't have to arrest on that third offense, but you can't issue them a civil citation because it has to be a collaboration and agreement between the state attorney, the judge, the, the chiefs, uh, the sheriffs, and everybody involved, DJJ involved in your community. So ours was too. So you have to strengthen your policy. So our policy says if you do not issue it to a child, which one officer didn't because the child was six foot tall, which that didn't go. It's like, look, the size of the child doesn't matter. But if you don't issue it, you have to write in your report why you did not issue it. And then you have to have a supervisor come in and authorize you not issuing that civil citation. So it's kind of a... Uh, we, it works. So now what we've seen over the last uh, couple, of, uh, couple of years, and let me just talk a little bit about our increase. I noticed I put this slide up here too. Last year we issued 159 civil citations. Even though Teen Court is run through Electoral County Sheriff's Office, we issued twice as many as they did. So you can see where your numbers start to go up and you start to have an impact and not arrest as many kids, which is what I'm getting to. Okay, so your civil citations, and you got to measure your effectiveness of your civil citation program. You have to run those kids every six months, see if they're recommitting, uh, if, if um, recidivism is an issue, okay, then maybe you need to adjust your program. Okay, right now our recidivism rate at our teen court is about 6%. It's not bad. Uh, now, I would challenge the DJJ recidivism rate in terms of kids that we ship off, and again, that's a moving target. Sometimes it gets around, hovers around 60%. So 60% chance that that child that comes back from an eight-month or one-year program now recommits, okay? And it costs what, 60000 bucks to send a child off? Give me 10000 Let me keep that child in Gainesville, okay? I will help the family. I will help that child. So I'll help everybody. So there's a lot of things to look at. Again, today I'm not trying to unemploy everybody, but at some point that's what we're going to be looking at. Okay, so just to illustrate that we've actually increased our civil citations, as you can see, we kind of just wallowed around the 50 number for a few years. Oh, this was fascinating. So I pulled up this civil citation dashboard, which I mentioned earlier on your Department of Juvenile Justice, Justice website. So as you can see, Gainesville Police Department, I actually put that up there, but it is Gainesville PD. You can search by circuit, county, gender, race, law enforcement agency. So I put Gainesville Police. And this is 2012, 2013. Well, that's a low hanging fruit. That's easy. Let's just reinforce, strengthen our policy of civil citations, and have the officers issue them. So now, 
this came out just, I think, a couple weeks ago or a week ago. That was last year. I can't see that number. 86% compliance with children that were eligible for a civil citation and those that received it. Okay? Now, why only 86% and not 100%? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Okay? I'm going to find out. But again, it talks about just the game. I just got the Gainesville Police Department up there, so I don't have Electric County. So they're not, I'm not responsible for them, but we, we mirror each other's programs a lot of. So that's pretty fascinating. You look at how far we've come just in a matter of a couple of years and giving more kids an opportunity to not have that face sheet, not have that criminal record, you know, have the success of teen court, which is chock full of consequences. You know, have you ever, my, my daughter went to teen court, right? I had to drive her there four or five times that summer. Right? She had to be a juror, had to go to anger management, had to get counseling. We had to go visit the, the, the jail. So there's a lot of programs tied into your teen court. You may want to strengthen it. Okay, and look at what you're doing. So it's an effective measuring tool. Has everybody looked at their civil citation effectiveness in their communities through DJJ? Is this something that you guys bring up all the time? They know how to access it and stuff? Sure. So use it, if, if not, use it as a starting point. Okay, this is where we're at. Where are we going to look at? So this actually will go back four or five years and let you look at some of your previous data. So real quickly, the school to prison pipeline, everybody ever heard of that? That's this whole idea that kids, by the time they get to the third grade, that you can pretty much say, huh, I think they're building a prison cell for him or her right now as we speak because they probably are. Because at the end of the day, when I talk about disparities, a lot of these kids that are coming to our schools, they don't know how to learn. They will learn, but they don't know how. They're going to learn something. They're going to get attention, and they're just as smart as the rest of the kids. We are all born the same. Okay, but at the end of the day, your dropout rates, your promotion rates, your referral rates, I guarantee it, you can look at your own data and look at mine, is going to be predominantly your minorities that aren't graduating, that aren't getting promoted past the third grade, that are getting most of the referrals. And those are stuff you have to, nobody's pointing fingers, when, especially the school board, because they play the biggest role. All your psychologists, your counselors, they got to be in these schools. Your diversions, not arresting kids in school, that's a big part of it. School to prison pipeline, it's an evidence-based research study that, that shows that a lot of kids are coming in, you know, because a lot of these kids, you know, when you look at, Maslow's hierarchy that we dealt with in high school, a lot of these kids have so many unmet needs, they're just trying to survive. You know, forget about, hey, I love you, or how was school today, or do you have any homework? But you gotta, better get up, I got breakfast ready for you. They don't hear those things. They're probably living with their grandmother on a couch. Most of these kids, look at them. Most of these kids that you arrest, you're gonna realize a couple of things. One, I've arrested them before. Two, DCF has been at that house quite often, I noticed, quite a bit. And I'll even throw in a third thing. They might have been a victim of, a, of assault, sexual battery, neglect. Neglect's not a one-time incident. When you look at adverse childhood experiences, like someone in your family got shot, parents got divorced, mom got arrested, adverse childhood experience, sexually battered victim, okay? That's not like neglect. Neglect is, is the biggest factor behind trauma. But neglect happens every single day, okay? And, and these kids... And when I talk to the officers about, hey, what can I do for those six hours I have them in school? Or what can I do for those 30 minutes that I'm talking to that child? And I tell them, you know, that six hours may be the safest that they feel. Or those 30 minutes may be the, the safest that they feel. I said, take advantage of that time that you have with those kids. Okay, and understand there's so much baggage behind, you know, where they've come from, what they've seen. And again, when I talk about survival, I mean, they're just trying to clothe themselves. And we know who they are. They're coming to school, sleeping in school, wearing the same clothes. Hungry? I mean, we see this, we see this every day. <clears throat> Some of our schools, and you do too. So school changes, uh, we had an MOU with a school board and Department of Juvenile Justice, stopped arresting kids on probation that attend school. We, um, so that was a big part of it. When we looked at our low-hanging fruit, when I talked about our DMC grant from three years ago, we started to look at, all right, what really were we arresting kids? And one of the things that we were doing was that if a child was put on probation, one of the conditions of his probation was what? Stay in school. So we have two alternative schools in Gainesville, in the city limits. So if a child gets kicked out of their regular school and they go to the alternative school, it's usually a kid from another gang, another neighborhood, got some discipline issues, behavior issues, right? So he comes to that school. So typically, if a child misbehaved in that school for whatever reason, right, and the child got suspended, what did we do as cops as of three years ago? That's what we did in Gainesville. What did we do? We did what? Vi arrest them for violation of probation. And then what do we do with them then? Took them to the Jack Center. And then what happened then? 
He, was, he might have been held, might have been released. Usually he was released back into his neighborhood that afternoon. A lot of these kids knew the system. They knew that, hey, this is a fast track to get to the Jackson or to get back into my neighborhood. You know, go ahead and arrest me. We arrested kids every single day. Why? This is what we did. It's what we knew. It's all we knew better. We didn't know, you know, that the, the damaging effect we were having on these kids that one were getting suspended, two were getting arrested. I mean, I wasn't a smart student, but if I missed five days of geometry, I was not going to catch up. I'm not going to catch up. So it's one thing to think about if you're not going to arrest these kids, there's got to be consequences and accountability, but it has to be done through the school. If you want to suspend kids, they have to stay in school. So you better promote, you better pay for in school suspension. You know, through all grade, and I hope you're not suspending elementary school kids, but middle, middle school especially, and some high school. These kids have to stay in school. So the idea was to allow, through the code of conduct, let the school handle them. So I'm going to show you some data here. We've reduced our arrests on campus. Again, most of those kids that were getting arrested on campus were what? On probation. Most of those kids that were on probation are what? African American. So again, it's a policy that applied to everybody, but it benefited African Americans the most. And so those are some of the things that you want to look at, you're probably already doing a bunch of those great things. So let the school handle. So what's spiked over the last couple of years? What is spiked in our schools? Two things. I know the judge is familiar, going to say one thing, but uh, school suspensions, that's spiked, and Baker Acts. Baker Acts. I got news for you. All kids want to kill themselves. All kids. Your own kids want to kill themselves. The kids in the schools want to kill themselves. They all want to kill themselves. Okay? All of a sudden, look at that like, man, this is a Baker Act situation. No, they all want to kill themselves. I'm running out of water. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so, um, so you want to train your school. Your, your guardians, when I talk about warriors versus guardians, your school resource officers and deputies are your guardians. Those, those are, they are practicing. They care. They love. They are cops for those kids for the rest of their lives. Those kids, when they grow up, even us, if we had cops in schools, we're, hey, Officer Bill, you know, there will always be that father figure, mother figure to them for the rest of their lives. They understand the impact that relationship building has. <clears throat> so you want to train the officers in trauma. What else is going on? Alternatives to arrest means you know, not arresting. DMC Red, embrace restorative justice. Uh, somebody mentioned, uh, to, I'm going to talk a little, little bit about restorative justice here at the end of my uh, presentation. So that's something I just pulled off. Didn't even know it was on there. Five-year trend on campus school arrests. It shows 69 in 2015, 16. So um, that's Alachua County. I couldn't break it down by just Gainesville. So that's the entire county. And most of the schools are in the county. So let me just, uh, I think I've got some additional data. This is how we reduced our on-campus juvenile arrest. So you can see a significant reduction from 2014 and 15. And I just added that text in the bottom. So last year, in addition to inheriting three middle schools last year, we only made seven arrests in our entire school system last year in the city of Gainesville. So obviously there's other schools in the county, but they're practicing a lot of the same programs that we're practicing as well. Okay, so there is the possibility. And I also have, and again, you want to look at your data, you want to look at who you're arresting. So we were down to seven in 2015, 16, because you measure your schools based on the fall and the spring. Right? They're not like calendar years or fiscal years, so you just got to kind of balance what you're looking at, too. So on-campus arrests on violation of probation charges, uh, we had four in 2014-15 probation charges. Now, what we do do, if that's properly said, <laughs> is that we will send a report to the JPO and say, hey, this young child has been acting up, you know, and, and it actually, we actually, everybody got the report, but then we finally realized Everybody was kind of getting inundated with reports. So it just goes to the JPO, hey, this child. So they'll usually respond within 24 hours, I'm sorry, 48 hours to the school. Okay, now what do the JPOs do when they respond to the school and, and deal with the child that may have misbehaved two days ago? What's, what's, their, what's their role? Let me, let me hear from a JPO. You show up at a school, child's misbehaved two days ago, what do you do? Anybody? <laughs> Anybody? Anybody that doesn't work in DJJ that maybe has a guess, what, what do they do? You talk to the kid, try to figure out what talk. led to the sure. incident. Sure. Talk to the kid, figure out what led to the incident. What's, what's, what's going on in your life? Why, why are you misbehaving? What's happening? Right? Those are three questions I answered there. Who besides the JPO can ask those questions? Why does it have to be a JPO? I was trying to make a point. The point is, law enforcement doesn't need this magical JPO touch. Well, I called the JPO and they didn't fix the child. The JPOs aren't really, 
wired that way. You know, they, they, they have as much experience in counseling. Maybe we have more that our schools have and our teachers have, the cops have, the state attorney has. So, so don't always rely on the JPOs to come out and fix a problem. You can fix it, you know, but, uh, but you got to work together. And it's kind of interesting. We're running a program here. So I went to my uh, Circuit 8 supervisor. I said, hey, I said, I want to get you guys off the intervention suppression side of what you do. She's like, what? So yeah, I want to get you guys on the prevention side. So I know DJJ does a lot of prevention programs. They do SNAP, Stop Now, and Plan. And there's a bunch of probably DJJ programs that are prevention driven. And that's the piece of it that I have in terms of prevention. So when I don't have the staffing, which I don't, or the money, which I don't, to run my summer programs, I go after DJJ and say, hey, I want to include you on my summer programs. School board, SROs, I want to include you. Okay, I want you to be on the prevention side so these kids look at you differently. Okay, when you're on the punishment side, they don't want to see you. They have a whole different perspective of you. So you've got to be on the prevention side. You have to develop their trust. And it takes time because not all kids will trust you. Trust me. And they're going to disappoint you, by the way. That's a fact. Um, so anyways, we looked at our school on-campus arrest. Those are the first thing, again, uh, low-hanging fruit. Now, this is a little bit of a stretch, which I brought to my chief. I said, Chief, I want to stop arresting kids 12 and under. And Chief Tony Jones, who said, Will, who's going to hold them accountable? What consequences are they going to have if we don't arrest them? Again, I said, Chief, it's not our job. It's not our job to arrest kids that are 12 and under. And I'm starting with 12. I'm going to move it up to 14 here in a couple years. So i got to start small. Ease everybody into this paradigm shift. It's not your job, officer, to arrest a 12-year-old child for fighting a 12-year-old neighbor or for misbehaving in school right? Or, or for maybe for stealing a bike in a neighborhood, you know, I mean, it's not our job. And so we, over the last couple of weeks, we just rolled out this policy. And so did the county. The county mirrored our policy and they have the same policy. Now, how is it working? I don't know yet. I would give you one incident where an officer responded to a 10 year old who was beat up by the neighbor's 10 year old. As it turns out, the lady that called us and complaining, her actual son was the bully. But these two kids go to the same, they live in the same neighborhood, they go to the same bus stop, they go to the same school. And this lady wanted that 10 year old arrested. Okay, and what I'm telling you is that we as cops, and I'm gonna tell the whole DJJ system this, and I told Secretary Daly, we're ready to change. The community is not ready to change. They are not ready to accept the fact that we are not going to arrest kids that are misbehaving in their homes and in their communities. But that's what's gotta happen. We gotta have that. And I think back to this policy, the officer said, ma'am, we don't, we don't arrest 10-year-old kids. You know, let the, let the chief answer to that. So digressing what happened, the officer shows up, writes a report, says, man, we're not going to arrest the 10-year-old neighbor. We have a policy that we're not allowed to do that. That lady said, you know, just because this is a section of housing and we're black, Mr. White officer, it's racist. You're doing it because you just are not wanting to put any time into what we're having out here. So that was her response. Her response was she truly believed because the white officer wouldn't make the arrest that that was racist. And that never dawned on me. I'm like, wow, man, I thought of that one. That's okay. But the officer kind of stood his ground, talked to her. The thing went all the way up to the chief of police. The lady came in and talked to the chief. She was angry, screaming and yelling. Chief came to me, Will, we got to do something. How about a civil citation? I said, Chief, he's 10 years. We're not going to issue a civil citation to a 10-year-old. Will, the, angry, the, the lady is angry. I said, Chief, I'll do a restorative circle with her. I said, no, Will, you don't understand how angry she is. I said, Chief, I don't do restorative circles with people to get along. I mean, what are you, well, of course I want her to be angry. I want people to hate each other. So I do. I get gangs in their sort of circles. All right, what are some of the differences? I mean, people to get along, who wants to, who wants to mediate? I guess, you know, you look at the principles of restorative circle. It's just like mediation. Right? Who wants to mediate two people to get along? That's no fun. So um, long story short, we, did a, uh, we have a, a River Phoenix Center for Peace Building in uh, Gainesville that we utilize for some of our uh, restorative circles. Uh, the lady came in with her 10-year-old. The mom and the other 10-year-old came in. We sat down. A, a teacher came in. And you bring in everybody that's impacted by the offense. And then you talk through it. So two and a half hours later, a, little, a few mea copas and a little bit of food, uh, the aggrieved mom, the mom that was most angriest, was, was taking those 10-year-olds to the movie that weekend. So I, the restorative circles do work. And what you're doing, you're not trying to, you don't get any benefit from punishing a child. You have to fix what happened at that bus stop or what's happening in that community or what's happening in that school. That's what you have to work on. This, this, this whole punishment model is, is not effective, I'm telling you. Sometimes it works when raising our kids, but otherwise it's not that effective. 
facilitated that circle? Law enforcement? Yeah, we put it together, right. So we have a civilian, again, it goes back to the trust. So we have a civilian partner that's an expert in mediation that is sort of also an expert in restorative justice. So there's there some training for restorative justice that you guys can, can see how it works and understand. I'm not sure why it works, but it works. And I, I even utilize that model with my own police officers. When you have all of a sudden two officers chipping at each other, and you all of a sudden you sit down and have to sort of face each other and figure out what's going on, it's a very effective tool. Yes, sir? What happens if that 10 or 12 year old child is a repeat offender, maybe a wannabe gangbanger or things like that, and we, he's get, given two or three chances to uh, correct his situation? Well, I, I think you've got to measure each case is different, but I agree with that. You know, you know there's, at some point, you, you've tried it, you've wasted, I don't say wasted, but you've tried enough services in your community that you ultimately would have to make it. We do staffings before we decide, you know what, at some point, we may have to make an arrest, we may have to use suppression. Because, you know, gang, but you can't just have that child keep breaking into cars and breaking into homes and people are now terrorized living in their neighborhood because this child keeps breaking into houses. So there, yeah, at some point you may have to utilize your suppression. Do you understand? And it's very difficult for cops to show up and all of a sudden try to read the history of that child within and make a two minute decision. You know, that's, that's the challenging part as well. All right, so I wanted to talk about this is our policy. We just rolled it out two weeks ago, uh, something to look at. So what do you got to do? Well, let's look at our data on our policies. Let's see if we've been arresting and who we have been arresting that are, that are 12 and under. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Hi. Um, yes, I uh, for for years I ran an in in house in school suspension. So I'm nervous <laughs> with this microphone. Uh, in in school suspension program um, for junior high and high school. I was part of the um, campus security and the program there that. I started, it did work, um, and um, I did, the recidivisms did go down. Um, I had to keep a lot of uh, documentation, and um, I would call parents when they were tardy and they were placed in my class. The, so the parents knew when their ch children were tardy, um, e either by them or because of the child, of themselves. Um, and we did, you know, I did give them um, work to do from the classes. I had um, help, you know, a student, student aides that would go to the classes and get their work. Um, and I mean, it, it was, it was a really, uh, I kept the type chip because there was uh, the gang population. There was different gangs in, in my class at all, you know, every day. And so, I mean, if it worked. Effort and as I talk about them, um, something to look at. So look at your data. So I looked at my data. I looked at Gainesville. And by the way, we had three crime analysts. Uh, one got promoted to a planner, two went somewhere else. So I have zero crime analysts at the Gainesville Police Department. So I, I'm doing all my own crime analysts. So just so you know, and, and I'm not wired that way either. So um, um, it's kind of interesting. So um, research behind arresting 12 and under. Youth lack cognitive skills, brain development. That's for a whole other four hour uh, session. Uh, Department of Juvenile Justice pro uh, process whether or not diverted at the state attorney's level could have long-term consequences. I mentioned the stigma, future LEO contact, like you mentioned, military, job, education, etc. Uh, law enforcement is, is ready for this change, but the community is not. And uh, we need law, we need po we need policy support. We need to tell those folks that, or at the schools this is why we're not going to do it because it's backed by policy. Uh, okay. And again, I mentioned I've said that a dozen times today. It's not our job. So I looked at our data, I just went back three years. So in 2014, 12 and under, including a nine, a couple of 10 year olds, uh, we had 58 arrests in 2014, all 58 were African American. When you're looking to infect or impact, okay, let me separate the two. You're looking to affect and impact your DMC relative, I get that, okay? But at the end of the day, you're looking to help this child become a benefit to the community, go to college, be effective. That's what really, that's really your goal. You know, so use DMC as a tool to get there. But looking at our data, I would challenge you to look at your data on your 12 and unders. Um, so all 58 were African American in 2014, nine were felonies. I think uh, the worst felony was someone breaking into a car, actually 
the car, opened up the car door and stole from inside a car, which is a car burglary, which is a felony. And I know I skipped over civil citations a little bit. Maybe I'll get back to it in a point. But I told Secretary Daly, I said, I need nonviolent felonies to be included in civil citations, please. I said the $300 threshold that distinguishes a misdemeanor from a felony was around, has been around for 30 years. Can we not raise that amount to maybe $1,500? <laughs> you know, these are some suggestions that, that we could benefit from because we're the gatekeepers. Because now all of a sudden you have nonviolent felonies that you're allowed to issue civil citations. We have to revisit some of these laws that we're enforcing. And the $300 threshold is one of them because most of the kids that go into Walmart are going to steal something worth more than 300 bucks. And unfortunately, officers don't have the discretion to issue a civil citation if it's a felony. Okay? I've written a dozen letters to legislators. I've got nothing in return, but that's a sidebar. All right. Two, uh, 2015, we arrested 22 kids that were 12 and under. Uh, 19 were African American, and there were four felonies committed. Again, uh, there, there were no gun cases in both of these. And these are what's cool about Gainesville is these numbers are. I can control, I, these numbers are small enough that we can actually get out there and do some effective work. And I get the bigger communities, the bigger cities, you know, they have probably a lot more issues than we have. So this last year, 15 and under, I'm sorry, 15 were arrested and 15 were African Americans. So you look at, what's my DMC? What, if you had to do a relative rate index on these numbers, if you added up 58, 22, and 15, and then added up 58, 19, and 15, what's your, what's your DMC number? pretty off the chart, probably about a 9.9 .9 on the relative rate. So, I mean, this is, this is a low-hanging fruit. This is good. Propose this. Pitch it. Do it. But back it up with accountability. There's got to be consequences. The community and those people that are victimized got to feel as though something is being done. This country is just indoctrinated in this whole idea that we have just this strong criminal justice response. Um, and again, we're all talking about kids. So when we talk about kids, it's easy to sort of to, to get in that door and have those discussions, whether it's your faith-based, your school board, your communities, all your churches, I'm telling you, are really interested in, in changing, you know, some of the, the DMC outlook and, and the future of some of these kids. So, um, juvenile arrest on domestic charges. I would uh, probably ask, I'm not going to give anybody a history lesson here, but I would tell you, when I started back in 1984, and I think it came out in 83, there was a, Minneapolis, Minnesota study that showed arrest is best. And that was the name of it, arrest is best. And so the state of Florida loved it. They put out this, you know, domestic violence response in terms of that's how we all developed our policies. If you're ever studying for promotion exam and you're a cop, you're going to spend half your day studying on domestic violence because it's gotten so complicated and so convoluted. Everybody's adding new stuff, date rape, everything. I'm sorry, date rape, dating and stuff like that. But Back in the day, when we would respond to a domestic, we typically would just try to separate the parents, and then we would leave. And we'd keep our fingers crossed that nobody called us the next day and said, hey, Will, that domestic you responded to, it looks like the husband just murdered the wife. And that was not unusual. Okay, I'm not saying they had to be married. I'm saying there was intimacy issues going on there. There was infidelity going on in that family. Okay, something might have been driving a lot of that. So once Arrest is Best came out, we have a very pro-arrest policy, right? Did you guys, your departments have a very pro-arrest policy on domestic, on domestic violence? When you're responding to it, as you're filling in your implicit biases, you're thinking to yourself, well, someone's going to jail on this call. I know that, you know, someone's going to go to jail. You respond, you separate the parties, you don't have all the information, you look at things that got tipped over, you look at the injuries, you listen to the call again that came in, you talk to the kids, you maybe talk to some neighbors, you identify the primary aggressor, and you arrest that person, regardless, every single time. And then we have people take witness statements that we have them write, we take pictures, we write a lengthy report, and it's a misdemeanor. Okay, for, but it's important. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm advocating for domestics. I think they're very, very serious. And we don't have all the tools to wait a couple of weeks to see if counseling or anything else comes into the picture, into the equation. So all of our policies on domestics are very strong towards arrest. Well, what happened over the last couple of years, the last 20 years, over the definition of a family? What happened? Anybody know anybody studied for the latest corporal, sergeant, lieutenant test? They kept packing on, you know, living as a family, child in common consanguination, blood related. All of a sudden, most situations, it was pretty much domestic. And it pretty much fell within your policy, which is what the state of Florida has. And that's, that's the policies that we all emulated. We developed our own policies. 
So the challenge that we had when we looked at our domestics was one, most of our domestics were happening where? In some of our economically challenged communities because of lack of parenting, lack of skills, they didn't know. And so we were getting called quite a few times to domestic in a lot, mostly our black neighborhoods. Why else was that happening? Besides the parenting, the disparities that have occurred the last 100 years, because I, and I got a revelation for a lot of folks in here. A lot of these families that have been dealing with you know, income and health, crime disparities, they don't wake up all of a sudden and say, man, I want to live in the projects. You know, I want my son to be in a gang. I want to be uneducated and unemployed. That's what I want. We don't, we don't think like that. That's not what's happening. These people didn't choose to live in some of the areas that they're living in, okay? A little sidebar. But when I talk about domestic, so a lot of our responses are, so look at your domestic. What are you responding to? Who are you arresting? A lot of the black kids that I arrested in my day was because I just thought, well, their family's just used to it. I didn't even explain first appearance to them. I just assumed they're used to that. They're used to it, you know? My, all my implicit biases, you know, just sort of 10 8, ready for the next call. That's how we handled domestics. So, what did we discover on our domestic uh, violences cases? Uh, going back, and I talked about the definition, I think most agencies probably still have a very strong, well, kids got sucked up into those definitions. And so we were showing up at cases where a 15-year-old was fighting a 13-year-old, brothers or siblings, as you call them, lived together as a family. What did they qualify under? Domestic violence. One of them went to jail. One of them went to jail and what? And it had to go to first appearance. Go to first appearance for a judge to issue what? You know, no contact order. I know that's been amended and it's changed, but no violent contact order. That's how we handle it in Latchville County, right? And then no contact with who? Well, your family. Well, okay, the, the, stop. This is archaic. What's the benefit? Do you really think that a 13-year-old or a 15-year-old fighting their parents that all of a sudden because you don't make an arrest, and by the way, you're protected by your decision, okay, that you don't make an arrest, that you think that child is going to come back that night because of infidelity and because of intimacy issues and kill their parents? Well, if you do, you've got a whole other set of issues going on. That's just not going. Are there an example of that happening? Yes. Right. But by and large, is that what we're trying to protect? No. Okay, so we end up arresting one of these siblings or the child call, or the, uh, fighting with the parent. And what does that create? Once we show up and arrest that child for not listening and being ungovernable and breaking the dining room table uh, with that parent, what did we just create by make, arresting that child? We enabled that parent to keep calling us every time that child misbehaves. Stop. Show up, ma'am. We're not going to arrest your child. I'll take him next door. I'll take him to Interface. Okay, I'll take him to an uncle's house, grandma's house. I'm not arresting him. We need, that, we need that authority, we need that power, we need that policy that backs up those decisions. It's goofy. Why are we arresting these kids and showing up and taking them to the county clinker? Doesn't make any sense. You know, they're not really benefiting from that. Nobody's learning their lesson. But again, when you're looking at your DMC numbers, that's something to target, your domestics. So our policy allows the officers broad discretion, not with adults, but with kids. With adults, they have to identify the primary aggressor. They have to do everything they have to do. With the kids, they still have the right to report. I'd love not the right to report. I would love for that to happen, but we still have to document it. But then we are allowed not to arrest the child. We can take the child elsewhere. Okay? So there's something to, um, something to consider when you guys are looking through a lot of your, you know, what's driving some of your numbers. Because within domestic are all those disparities that we talked about. But within domestic are when you start to see all that stuff rise to the surface. And we continue to define these families and these kids by criminal behavior. It's not criminal behavior. It's not. But there's a lot of statutes that you can identify anybody in terms of what they offended. So we started looking at, you know, that was some of our initial DMC numbers, looking at our reductions uh, in some of our, again, most of the kids that we were arresting were African American in these homes. Now, we never arrested two parents or one child, you know, both the kids because the state attorney couldn't prosecute the case, so you're always trying to identify the victim and the offender. You had to distinguish the two. So we are very, our policy also doesn't allow us to make two arrests. We always have to make just the one. Okay, so when you are looking at some of your stuff to look at, um, look at that. So um, because they are domestic in nature, the Gainesville Police Department may refer these cases to CDS, which happens to be our go-to um, corner drugstore. It's actually Community Behavioral Services. They changed their, not their acronym, but they changed their name. So we make referrals. Because our job is to make referrals. Our job is to make sure that this family, this child, this, this mom, or this dad with bad parenting skills maybe, maybe they get some assistance too. We can't do everything. So then we reach out to Partnerships for Strong Family. 
Okay, then you reach out to some of your stakeholders in your community and say, hey, would you, can you please come over and help us out? Now, ideally, ideally, if I had my druthers, and I, was, I would pay a lot more civilians working law enforcement than I would sworn, because most of what we did, what we do can be handled by the civilians. Traffic crashes, civilians, right and burger reports, civilians. So now you have a social worker and a mental health expert that now, once you've made the scene safe, can now come in and do some counseling. That particular, that call, 3 o'clock in the morning, fascinating, fascinating. They can now make the referrals. Because it's very difficult to make referrals. Because you're looking through, okay, who should I send them to? So cops, we need like a sort of a one-stop where to send this child. I can't really articulate some of the unmet needs or what's going on, but there are some problems here, Will, I'm going to tell you. So that's really our job, to really siphon those out and figure out where are the best services for that family. And until you start to address those issues with that family, you're going to continue to see the same cycle of families, the same, again, I mentioned the same last names, the same first names. I remember I used to always think, well, that should be a crime. If you name your child the same first and last name, and you are notorious in this community, that should be illegal, you know, but... Uh, <laughs> Yes, sir. Well, you, you mentioned that the parents are offered uh, parenting skills. Uh, to that's, I think, you know, that's, that's, a, that's more complicated than just that. I think a lot of these families that we're dealing with have had a lot of services recommended to them. And so it's, it's really the approach and, and how you would really offer those services. So that's a gap that we haven't really dealt with in terms of accountability. Like, hey, CDS, are you actually going out that next morning? Because when I see kids on my status report or getting arrested, I'm telling you, JPOs aren't going out that next morning and saying, hey, what's going, you know, what's happening in this family? Why did he get arrested, he or she? They may or may not get assigned a case. The, the case may get pled out through, uh, um, not direct file, direct commit before, before DJJ ever gets involved in it, you know? So there's, there's that gap. So when you start to see kids that are having those issues that next morning, that's when the services need to be at the house. So that's, uh, that's some community issue we're dealing with. We don't have the answer to that or the solution. There are referrals that we make, and we believe they're making contact with a family, but how effective those are, I mean, there's a lot of elusiveness when you're looking to, to, to measure people's results. Say, how effective are you? So, you know, I, my numbers are my numbers. I mean, I can, you know, I get measured, unfortunately, on, on, on arrest, and so that's what I wanted to share with everybody. So uh, domestic, any other questions about domestic violence that's not already in your policy or something that you guys are working with? And, you may be already be doing some things. So when I talk about data, so when we really rolled out through late, early 2014, we rolled out police youth dialogues, DMC, racial and ethnic disparity, policy changes, not arresting kids in school, letting the school handle it, civil citation, strengthening that. So we started to see a significant reduction in arrest. So last year we arrested 296 kids, total, total. And that was down from the year before when we started to really see some of these policy changes get traction. So you're looking at for our community, and I think I've got it. Okay, so let me, dig, let me just, I'm going to get back to those numbers here in a second. But I want to let you know why relative rate index or DMC is such a unicorn. Okay, when you look at our numbers um, from 2014 to 15, we arrested almost 240 less African-American children. But we arrested... 20 less white kids. You understand what I'm saying? So even though we impacted, and affected, and benefited 240 African American children, we still lost. We, our DMC numbers got worse. Okay, so I'm, that's why I'm saying don't get obsessed or consumed. Now everyone's going to come in and say, "Whoa, your DMC numbers," and I get it. I do. I understand what it means. I understand how to utilize it. But this is just to illustrate that even though you're trying, you know, you're doing the best work you can out there. Not arresting 240 less African Americans in our community, that's huge. That's big. Okay, but at the same time, our DMC numbers didn't get any better. And at the same time, it's going to be 10 or 15 years before we really start to have an impact and reduction on our relative rate index, you know. Okay, so and I think I've got the, okay, so I just wanted to do a 10 year quick snapshot of our arrest, you know, the Gainesville Police Department. Uh, these are not sworn compliance, these are just arrests. So you can see where we sort of, 10 years, now this is only 10 years, so you can see how far we've come. So there's been tremendous gain, I think. But again, there still has to be, you know, the underlying issues that are still percolating within those homes and those communities, the, the, the disparity that I talked about, those issues still have to be dealt with. And so they still, those are challenges that we're still, still dealing with right now because we have the same communities 30 years ago. We are policing those exact same communities for the exact same reasons. Nothing is really changing sometimes, you know. 
but, but law enforcement really has to sort of take a step back sometimes and realize that, that the changes doesn't have to be done through the juvenile justice system, I guess what I'm saying. So that's something to, to think about. And the biggest change we had, again, we rolled out most of our changes, was, uh, was the 358 number. I think that's why I highlighted it. And I'll talk about, now you look at our state attorney, I got their numbers for the last 15 years. Uh, the column on the right shows cases, arrests, and sworn complaints. So you can see we've had some, uh, and then last year was 775 in 2000. I don't have that on here. 2016 was 775 cases you know, that the state attorney got received from, from, that's the entire county. I'm sorry, that's the entire, that's the entire circuit. Yeah, because Alachua County and Levy County and stuff, that's what that is. So, and when I talk about, now my relationship with our juvenile chief, I was very respectful and, and, and we get along great, but we're at polar opposite sides. We are complete, we joke, if I'm helping a child or I'm advocating for a child or in court and that child screws up again, she'll text me and call me and you know, hey Will, so and so got arrested. I'm like, yeah, thanks Rebecca. <laughs> I mean, that's just the relationship you have, you know? But I'm convinced by the time of her career, I'm gonna prove to her that you know, these methods you know, are, 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 are tangible, these methods are sustainable, and this is what we have to be doing. So I'm, um, and, and, and don't misunderstand, I'm a suppression guy too. You know, I'm a suppression, we start to see, I think when you break down your crimes, you start to see really how few very violent crimes you have with your youth, you start, huh, man, that's only a few percent. I mean, because I'm, I'm, you know, when you start to bring in guns into situations, guns into schools, you know, you, when you start to have those, those home invasion robberies, carjackings, you got some problems. You know, the community expects you to do the suppression piece, absolutely. Any questions about, you know, just I know you guys are looking at your data too as well, so maybe you guys got some different numbers than I do, but I just want to illustrate some of the short term, some of the efforts, some of the results that we are starting to see. Okay, and then I mentioned 775 last year. So, <clears throat> so one of the other things that we're doing, I don't think I have many slides on it, I want to get to something here real quick, is uh, we have what's called a system of care. So all of our schools, the school board supports it, it's where they have mental health and social workers assigned to the elementary schools. So they have a director of the system of care. It started out from Judge Stephen Teske out of Clayton County, Georgia. Anybody ever heard of his program? Um, you have? Yeah, he does, he's worked a lot with CCLP. And so we saw what he did, and we wanted to double down on it because he was trying to divert kids from the criminal justice system. We're trying to divert kids at middle and high school, but we're also trying to recognize and identify those kids early on that clearly have some unmet needs and clearly need some wraparound services, obviously. And that's where, and the schools are your, kind of your petri dish, man. That's where you can do all your good lab work, I guess. I don't know if that was inappropriate, but you know, that's where they're at. That's where they show up. They're in school. The teachers can see it. The, the officers can see it. The social workers can see it. So that's where our system of care. I'm going to cycle through a few. That's, uh, I think I presented at the county one time with some, our system of care. I wanted to let them know who our stakeholders were. So you probably have a very similar um, stakeholder in terms of everybody wanting to meet, you know, but you don't want to keep meeting all the time. I mean, you want to be effective and make some changes. So that's our system. I have U of F on there, and I don't mean to be critical of U of F, but they're not a lot of help in a lot of our youth programs. In fact, there's zero help, okay? Now they're good at buying land and building new places and gentrification and everything else, but they're certainly not helping with the youth. Okay, that's our typical meeting. It's the, it's the second Monday of the month at, at the Gainesville Police Department. You guys probably have something similar. And that's our goal, an effective system of care that ensures Alachua County youth and their families receive resources. Again, it's not about when you have a child in your elementary school that's displaying some, 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 some issues, okay? You better deal with that child, those siblings, and the parents, okay? And that, that's my point is that system of care is not about helping a child, but helping the whole family. Because if you're not providing services, and I guarantee your service resources are very rich in this community too, you have that out there. So I, I, it's something to, to think about. Uh, just a tier system, so we still try to adjust the behavior in the schools. Uh, again, an MOU, transportation is a big issue. I always talk about, give me a grant titled Food and Transportation. That's all I want it titled, Food and Transportation, and I will fill in everything else. Because that's, that's my, those are my biggest two needs, food and transportation. Okay, so that's, as you guys experience that, I'm sure. Um, and, and including uh, the, your youth. So faith-based, I didn't put many slides on here. I think you have a very strong faith base. In fact, I read your Bridging the Gap uh, program you guys have where you have reached out to the communities. What, I, I don't, I'm gonna be careful how I say this and I'm probably gonna say it wrong. I just, I just this is Will's perspective. Um, 
uh, I'll be real quick about it. I, I have noticed over the last couple of years how many of our predominantly, you know, historical white churches just want to do whatever they can. And so the, the African-American churches in those neighborhoods have been dealing with these issues for a long time. But all of a sudden, I'm starting to see a lot of money, a lot of resources, mentors, everything from a lot of predominantly white. And I just have seen that the last couple of years. And maybe I've just been ignorant to it, you know, but I've seen my point is take advantage of this momentum. You know, where everybody's sort of on the same page, want to do a bunch of great things. Because people are fascinated by all the programs that you're running with these kids, fascinated, and they want to help. They just don't know how to help, and they want to help. So, uh, okay, I just touched, I'm not going to spend much time on mental health, but, you know, I talk about, I talk about, uh, we do a 40-hour uh, crisis intervention team training. You guys have something similar, 40 hours or first aid. Um, we actually started doing the mental health first aid in some of our communities, just as an idea, something to think about the mental first aid, because we did it in response to when we shot and killed Robert Dentmont. We started rolling out some of the mental health uh, to some of the communities, some of the neighborhoods, our crime watch meetings and stuff like that. We were very well received. Um, understand trauma. I, I mentioned a little bit of adverse childhood experiences. Uh, again, it's one of our weaknesses in law enforcement. What happens when a weapon shows up? I, I, I advocate de-escalation, um, you know, as, as an approach, it's, as, as opposed to something to think about. How do you train on it? Very difficult, very difficult to train. I was talking to a group one time, and one guy who was a prior military, he says, well, we just need to be braver, Will. We just need to be braver. I'm like, well, I get that, but how do you put that in policy? You know, be braver, you know? And, and what I wanted to, let me go back to it, because I was thinking of Tamir Rice when they pulled up in Cleveland and jumped out and shot the 12-year-old with a, with a BB gun, you know? Now, that wasn't where officers go up and say, hey, Officer Smith, you know, he, he chose that this day. You know, don't worry about it. It's a, it was good shooting. Hey, man, we're caught. That's not what we want to hear. We just, we just took, took a juvenile's life. And so people don't understand that we are very, very, very human. And most officers involved in shootings where they kill a juvenile or a young person don't last in that line of work. You know, there's about 80% of them will not last. And so the officers that were involved in a Dittmont shooting, once they found out he was 16, we didn't know that, that he was 16 and the gun was fake, those officers are dev they're devastated. Their lives will never be the same, ever. So I just, just I, I want to say that to some of my community folks in here that think, you know, oh, good shoot, good shot. You know, he probably made that decision that day. It wasn't your fault. Good job. You know, whatever. You know, FOP comes in, whatever, PBA. That's what we do. This is cops, what we've always done. But we don't want to do that, you know. We had an incident where BB guns. You guys experiencing all these BB guns? These BB guns that look like real guns? Well, we're getting those all over these communities. They look like real. In fact, they even say Smith & Wesson on them, you know, and if you look at the, it's not a BB hole at the end of them. It's been recessed to look like a 45 or something, and these, these look are identical, and some of the revolvers have the bullets in them, where if you looked at it and it was daylight, it was good, you could see the bullets in them. So my issue was after this was that, you know, we have to train the officers on, on, uh, on these BB guns. They're all stealing them from Walmart, and we ended up getting Walmart to put them behind the case, but regardless, all these guns are showing up, and I had a lot of pushback. Will, we don't want the officers to hesitate. If they feel as though it's, it's a death situation, we don't want them to hesitate by showing. I said, you know what? I said, I'm not just trying to save that child. I said, I'm trying to save that officer. I said, that, that you guys don't understand. I asked, oh, yeah, we're tough. But, you know, living with that, understanding, and that, that's a hard thing to reconcile in a process. So Community Heroes Initiative, we do this every summer. We, um, I just wanted to share one of the programs. We take, uh, again, when I looked at my numbers, I've got 25 kids that committed five or more offenses. I've got 103 kids that committed two or more offenses. So my kids are manageable. You know, if I can just get those right children, those right kids to deal with. So we start out, we're gonna start out this year too. We get this particular case. I think we had uh, 13 kids in 2015, all belong in the same gang. Um, and all of a sudden we expose them to a Tampa Rays baseball game, Mayport Naval Academy, the beach, life skills, writing a resume, dating, how to treat women. And so everybody in your community, that's where I go to. When you start to reach out to Chick-fil-A and all these restaurants, they want to give, 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 give. Okay, so, so take advantage of that. So the, the, the unique thing about this 13, we had the camo gang. After it was all over, the camo gang dispersed. Um, nobody got arrested. Three of the kids went through youth build, got their high school degrees. One's working at Walmart. One's a mechanic at a store. They both want opportunity to succeed. Kids want boundaries. They want opportunity. So we do ropes course. I took them golfing. And a couple of kind of unique. Some of the kids actually are pretty good at golf. Um, these are all the gang. I don't take the easy kids. They're all on probation. They're all dropping out of school and they're all in gangs. Those are the kids that we try to work with because they're all leaders. Man, don't go after the kid that's following. Go, go, always go after the leader. And we have the ability with our uniforms as cops 
and all of a sudden they realize that we're human and we're breaking down all those barriers, it's powerful. You know, we have a lot more benefit than maybe a social worker does showing up because we're, all of a sudden they see us in a different light. <clears throat> it's, it's strong. So um, this is our group. In fact, we met last night um, at the city, I'm sorry, the night before last at City Hall. So we empower them to run the commission, run the meetings. What do you want to see? These are all gang kids. Uh, most of these kids have ankle monitors on them that are in this meeting. Um, so just something to think about when you're really starting to look at who you want to, now how do you, and again, you have to measure your results. So we look at, and the pushback I get from cops is like, Will, you know, this is a hug-a-thug program. You're wasting your time. I can't believe you're dealing with that kid, et cetera, et cetera. We hear that stuff. I, I get it. You know, I hear this stuff. It's like, look, during those three months, okay, those 13 kids, or last, last summer was 20 kids, I said, you didn't have to respond one time to that house or to that neighborhood and respond to any incidents involving those kids. I guess because I usually had them out of town on that particular day. Or they're involved. Or they're in our basketball. They had a basketball team. We were 0-8. That doesn't matter. They're all going to be NBA players, by the way. So, so, so basketball is a big carrot, man. That's a carrot. You know, understand what drives these kids. And so, so that was my pushback. It's like, look, I'm not saying you don't arrest these kids. I'm not saying you don't suppress them. But don't criticize what I'm doing on the backside of it because that's just as important. You know, and if they end up screwing up, and I give you an example, one of the kids from last summer um, committed two burglaries during July 4th weekend. But I'm a civilian, I'm retired, but the burglary uh, sergeant called me up and said, hey, Will, you, Eric, we got him fingerprints. They get fingerprints like the next day now. I don't understand how this works. <clears throat> I'm like, okay, well, let me go get him. So when I picked up Eric, said, hey, man, come on. I said, you're going to tell the truth? You're going to talk to the officers? And he, he admitted to it. He was so disappointed that he disappointed us. That was really what, what bothered him the most. And then uh, he went off to an eight-month program. And um, I was there when he got back. And I'll be, you know, I'm not, I'm not avoiding or abandoning these kids, but man, trust me, every cop in my tactical briefing wanted to show, and Will tried to help this kid, and he did his burglaries. And so they'll, they, <laughs> you got to laugh, because it's kind of funny sometimes. So you, they'll throw it back in your face. But you got to measure, okay, how effective are we during the summer now? So in that 2015, we, only, we reduced our, our arrests on kids by uh, significantly, I think, 40%. And then last year, we had 60 arrests during the summer. So there's, but, but none of the kids that are involved in this program get arrested. When we cut them loose for school, that's a whole different story, you know. So then they started to get back in their old, their old ways. So we're also moving it down this year to, to middle school kids. We're recognizing and realizing, man, we've got a lot of 13, 14, 15-year-old kids in gangs, you know, and neighborhood cliques, gangs, and really starting to get influenced by the older kids. And plus, the older kids are interested in driving and jobs and and dating and stuff like that. So the middle school kids are kind of a little, kind of interesting to deal with right now. And the picture I just showed you were, were all middle school, all middle school kids. Um, I'm going to just try to show this video here real quick. And then if not, I'm going to, uh, it's not what happened. I'm going to um, continue. So if you guys would just bear with me. I know it's hard to hear. So who remembers what happened? Uh, just give away. Who remembers what happened after that? What happened? He came over the next day. Sorry, guys. Okay, so Shaquille O'Neal came over the next day. Um, hang on a second. 
just going to minimize that. And um, and then he played, went out to the kids, talked to the kids, gave some, obviously he's had some practice dealing with some of the kids. Um, the officer, uh, Bobby White, uh, then recognized the importance of it at the time in this country. Why, why was that so significant? Did anybody want to share with me why that was so significant? Somebody. What was so significant about the officer playing basketball with the kids? Yes, ma'am. Right? Part of it? Yep, absolutely. Anybody else? It was white. What's that? It was white. It was white? I, yeah, I, I agree with that. Absolutely. Anybody else? Why was this video significant? Because everything on TV was cops killing people. Well, that bang, bingo. Yeah. And it still proves why you can't jump. <laughs> I, I am going to share that with, with Officer White when I ask. <laughs> All right, um, somebody, somebody hit on too. At the time, this country was going, we were going through a lot, you know, from Ferguson to Dallas, uh, from Louisiana, we had the officers killed, and so people were picking sides, you know, who put it back, and I think the country just needed to see that. I don't know why, because I woke up the next day, it was on CNN, and I just didn't get it. I said, man, we, that's all, we, we play basketball with kids every single day. We, that's all we do. Flag football, basketball, I mean, we, we just participate with these kids all the time. But I think the country just needed to see that. I think they just needed to see that. And that's why it kind of went viral. And when I say it went viral, it really went viral. There was millions of hits on that, on that website. And, um, oh, sorry. So after that, Shaquille O'Neal showed up. And then after that, the company that uh, makes basketball rims uh, uh, wanted to pay for a basketball court in the backyard of one of the young men there. So they built a half-court basketball in the backyard. They paid for everything. And then the NBA reached out to, uh, to Bobby and... Um, Microsoft reached out to Bobby, and so he's got the Basketball Cop Foundation. So Bobby, he's built three outdoor basketball gyms in Gainesville already, but he, he donates basketballs and stuff around the country and just realized there was a real need. The other thing I want to tell you, which is pretty fascinating about that video, which may be the biggest part of it that you didn't realize. Remember that video I showed you at the very beginning of this class? That was the same officer. So that was four years ago, and Officer White, again, there's a little bit of you know silver lining, I guess, to to describe it. I mean, but he just really believes that we have to have these relationships with these kids. All those kids that you see right now are the kids that he took down to Orlando with them. Orlando Magic. He has them over at Christmas all the time and dinner and Thanksgiving. Even though the video was two, it was a year and a half ago, but he's developed those relationships with those kids. So it's pretty fascinating. But how far you know when people are measuring what is, what does the community want to see? Do they want to see what happened in the first video, or they want to see that? And that's what we have to be mindful of and cognizant of as cops, you know, and, and the optics and what, what, we're out there, what, what we're out there doing. Okay, real quick, I'm going to talk because I'm going to come in and fix this, but please, you, any questions about the, the Bobby White video? Thank you guys for, for watching that thing. It's a Gainesville GPD thing. It went viral. Not sure why. Um, real quickly, police youth dialogues. Anybody have something similar where they have a, a police youth summit or you guys have some of these things? We do and have done for three years was called a police youth dialogue. So once a month, uh, the last Tuesday of the month, we bring in 10 to 12 at-risk kids, at-risk youth in need of services, deep in, to find them how you want. We bring in 10 to 12 at-risk cops. I say that only because everybody thinks the training's for the other party, right? And they all come in. And so we sit down and bring them in. And most of our kids come from DJJ. Most of them come from DJJ. They may come from gangs. They may come from the school board, teen court. We get some youth that way. Most of them are African-American. And so we sit down in a circle, like a restorative justice circle, and we have a discussion. We sort of break down barriers. We try to figure out who's doing what and why, and why we do what we do as cops, and why kids feel the way they do, you know, in their communities too. So it's a very powerful discussion. So the very, now we collaborate with um, Jeffrey Weisberg, who, who runs the, uh, the River Phoenix Center for Peace Building. And if you're familiar with Joaquin Rivers and, and um, River Phoenix, did I say it right? Joaquin Phoenix and River Phoenix. Those that are one brother, River died about 20 years ago now. I couldn't believe it. But they're all into, into the um, acting and stuff like that. So they have a, they're a good uh, community partner with us. And so we co-facilitated. I do it with Jeffrey Weisberg because 
as, as officers, I mean, anytime, or the community, anytime the cops are trying to sell you something, you're like a little suspicious, but you bring in, and we are too, as officers, we like to hear experts that aren't our training officers all the time. You know, we like to hear some real experts. So we just saw the benefit, and we've tw changed and tweaked this thing quite a bit. So we come in, we bring them in, you can see the picture, that's not unusual. I have the officers for the first hour, and for the first hour, I talk about DMC, policy, civil citation, brain development, trauma, I kind of cycle through it for the first hour. And Jeff has the kids for the first hour. I also do an A to Z exercise where I have the, the, the officers describe an adjective kids, you know, from A to Z. So every alphabet letter has got to have a, a, a description. And the kids have to do the same thing, describing officers. We do this independent of each other, okay? And then we bring the groups in together. And typically what happens when you bring all the groups in together in that one room, just like we're starting to develop, but before my, my friends up here sat in the middle, you start to see the cops on one side, the DJJ folks on the other side, that's typically what we see. And then we do like an icebreaker real quickly with the kids. And so you've got about 23, 24 people in this room. And then the first icebreaker is you have to say something about yourself. And if it applies to you, you have to stand up and move chairs or move to a different chair. So we have the children, you know, stand up and you change, you change chairs. So the cops will get involved. Everybody loves it. We go for about 10 minutes, you know. Uh, so it's called the when the wind blows. And so by the time you've jumped up and changed, kind of like musical chairs, then you look around and everyone's kind of mixed up. That's kind of how you start your, your discussion. You look around, you've got cop, child, cop, child, cop, child. It's just something to do if you guys are having those discussions when you clearly see, you know, that folks are sitting in their own camps, right? So that's the first thing we do. And then we start to talk about, you know, the A to Z and exposing what the kids said about cops. And I can tell you, having done 50 of these at least, okay, we get the same comments about cops, and about a cop from kids. And it's just like cops. Cops are trying to be, who can be the toughest cop and say the worst thing about a kid. The kids are all trying to say the worst thing about a cops. And so typically your A to Z will show killer, rapist, um, murderer, um, and just all the worst things you could possibly say about a person that you now you have to walk in and the kids see, uh-oh, these cops are going to see, you know, what we said about them, but also the kids are going to see what the cops. But that starts your conversation. You know, from there, you may segue into some other topics, some other issues. You know, why do you kill blacks? That's a topic that comes up all the time. Why do you as officers kill black people? I mean, that's a very, very common topic that comes up. So for the first hour, you'll have a lot of discussion about those issues that when I talk to the officers about what they feel and what they believe is important, A, for your officer safety, but it's important for you to understand and, and accept what they're feeling. I said, you may not agree with it, but if that's coming from you, and I think it's fascinating, when I first started a lot of my training with the officers, I would ask some of the, and, and this has happened every single time, I would ask some of the African-American officers, all right, who has children? I'd ask everybody, who has children? And so, so some of the African-American officers would raise their hands. I said, who tells their kid that when they drive at night, if your kids are driving, that if a police officer pulls them over, to please put their hand on the steering wheel, please don't say anything disrespectful, I don't want you to die. Now who tell, has that speech with their kids? I have not had that speech with my kids, and none of the white officers have had that speech with their kids, but the black officers have had that speech with their kids. And people are like, why would you have that speech? Why would you think that this is because you got to understand this, you got to agree with it, but that's what they feel. That's what they're feeling. And that fear is going to cost you your life if you don't recognize it. Recognize, hey, there's a fear here. I need to recognize that there's a fear and I have to work through it. You know, so, so that's an important discussion to have during that, that first hour as you have those, those dialogues. So then we, um, then we, the most powerful part of the, of the discussion, and it's a five hour training block, oh, by the way, and everybody comes in, all the cops do, uh, uh, oh, five hours. But it goes quick. Because then we bring in that good food like Zaxby's or something, and then everybody gets to eat, and the kids each have to eat with the officer, right? And so they have a one-on-one. -on -one. And we actually have questions they can ask each other, but we've never needed them because the kids just ask fascinating. These kids are brilliant. I like to say a lot of times the kids will raise the conversation up, and the officers will just push that conversation right back down again. The kids are brilliant. And we talk about hopes and dreams, and these cops get to see that these, these gang kids, they want to be chiropractors. They want to be nurses. They have dreams themselves. Everybody wants to be an NBA player, and we get that part of it too. But, but there are dreams that they have, and it's really designed just to break down those barriers with the officers. Now, do the officers change? Some do. I think there's some, there's some subtle differences. We do pre and post, like University of Florida should be doing, but we do it. We do pre and post for the kids as well. But we see huge changes in the children. When the children first come in here, they don't trust the cops. They don't want to be in the same room as the cops. But by the time they end, they talk about the humanity and how they are so much like those officers. And that's one of the benefits. When I talk about we make deposits in our community, these police youth dialogues or these 
uh, police deputy dialogues, they do the same program. They do theirs, they've done theirs for two years now, and they, they go around the community. The problem with staffing at the police department, we have to bring people off the road to staff that five hour training, and, and staffing is a real issue in law enforcement. They got a grant, 50 something thousand dollars, the officers sign up for their program, so it's a little different, but it's just as beneficial and just as effective. When I said we gotta pass, from shooting Robert Dentmont, I mean, it was, and we didn't do these dialogues because it was in response to what happened in Ferguson, Missouri. We just knew that we weren't communicating with these kids. We were arresting too many of them. We didn't understand trauma. We didn't understand the impact that we were having on these kids. So I would recommend if you want, or if you need help starting a dialogue, don't do one or two a year where folks are standing up on a platform, you know, talking to kids and telling them, you know, about behavior. I mean, that stuff's important. But at the end of the day, you want everybody to be on the same page. That's why you use a circle. You want everybody to be neutral. But that conversation between those at-risk kids and those cops are just, just paramount. It's funny because most of the kids that we are having, they all want to come back. You know, they all love it. They want to come back. And we also now roll this out at the colleges. So we've done, we do about four at our community colleges, which is fascinating because we actually did one with the faculty members there, which is fascinating because you wouldn't believe some of the thoughts that the faculty members have about cops. And the cops need to understand that, you know, with the, with the colleges. And the college kids are brilliant because you see what were these little kids, and all of a sudden these kids are in engineering school and everything else, and, and it lets cops open up their eyes to see, hey, just because they're dressed this way and have the dreads and talk like this, they can still become, you know, very productive and do some great things in their lives. So the college piece of it, I, I absolutely, I just love. University of Florida it didn't work out too well because we got a lot of Middle Eastern students that showed up, and they were, it was fine, but it didn't, wouldn't really have any impact that I wanted. Yes, sir. Now, how often do you have to do that? This is the second one that we've done. Uh, we the second one what? Second term. And how long? Two years. OK. So the only point, and thank you, because you know all the, you know, the uh, Coffee with a Cop, um, all these programs, the basketball, you have to continue all these things all the time. There's no end game here. There's no like, hey, we're just going to do it once a year. And that's why I'm talking about the Police Youth Dialogue, because this is not, hey, let's just make the community feel good for that moment. They have to believe that you're vested into some of these programs and these changes. So I um, appreciate that. Yeah, that's a, we have big response with the basketball games, too. We haven't won yet. Um, I, I, I just wanted to talk briefly. Any questions about the police youth dialogue or a model you can use? Again, you can use that sort of it's a restorative justice model, which I mentioned earlier about the two 10-year-olds. So when you sit down and have people have to have that discussions face to face, they're very productive. So I would certainly try to include like some of these dialogues that you're having and see if don't, now is that a panacea? Is that all, okay? oh, that's, that's gonna solve our DMC issues, no. Nothing that I said here today is going to address all of your DMC issues and your community issues, but you've gotta start them now, you've gotta make them part of your everyday curriculum and you gotta do it because you wanna do it. So I'm going to, uh, do I have any questions for today because obviously we shut down a computer, I just had a restorative justice pictures on there, some other stuff, but I'm just, uh, I'm just honored to come in here and talk to this group. Um, again, I'm not asking you to believe or buy into everything that I say. Um, what works for us may not work for you. Um, I hope you, you can take a little bit of, of what you learned today out with you, whether it's implicit bias or procedural justice or, you know, some of the programs that you saw here. Um, on that note, does anybody have any other questions for me? It's past 12 o'clock. I know everybody's getting hungry. And as a cop, man, I mean, I got to eat at 12 o'clock. Okay. That being said, thank you very much. I appreciate it.